things. So uh, this talk is going to be about subspecies variation, and you see the, the, the word revisited in it. I'm uh, in the process of writing a few papers that had this title in it. So going back to some topics that have been looked at in the past, but uh, there's still more to be said. So the problem with dressing is uh, you've probably seen with subspecies iteration it is applied to uh, uh, eigenvalue problems. So you see here a few applications, structure engineering, electronic structure, stability analysis, and so on. And all of these applications uh, deal essentially with computing a few eigenvalues on one end of the spectrum, either higher or lower. But in reality, what is uh, needed is to compute an invariant subspace. So it's a subspace X such that AX is included in X. Or if you want to represent it with, a, with respect to a basis Y, so you need to, have to solve the, something like AY equals to YC, where C is M by M. And M is the dimension of the subspace, and Y is now the basis. This is actually a very common calculation, and it's important to view it this way as opposed to just an eigenvalue problem. Here are some of the problems you can associate with subspaces. Uh, first of all, you need to approximate the subspace, and then in many applications, you need to update it uh, when data changes or whatever. You want to estimate the dimension sometimes. Uh, you uh, want to exploit the sub subspace in sort of some calculations. And then there, is, uh, there are applications in where you need to track the subspace in uh, sub signal processing. Uh, and then another application, I will, I will talk about it towards the end, is to find a common subspace to several matrices, common invariant subspace to common matrices. So I'm going to go back to some basics uh, of uh, just introducing sp subspace iteration. And the key ingredient there is really its projection. So you're given a subspace uh, X, the notation has changed a little bit, uh, we know that it contains uh, good approximations to eigenvectors of A. The question is, how do you extract those eigenvectors and eigenvalues? And uh, you need a projection process for this. So this goes as follows. You construct an orthonormal basis of X, so the Q1, Q2, QM. And then you express the approximation U tilde as Q times Y. So this is the, your basis and Y is the, essentially the coefficients of the vector U tilde in the basis. And then you, ex you express the fact that the residual, which is this thing, is orthogonal to the subspace, which you write in the following manner by saying this is orthogonal to QH. And then you get this small eigenvalue problem to solve, which gives you uh, lambda tilde, and it gives you Y at the same time. OK. So this is called the Rillerich really process, okay? And it's key to many, many uh, methods. Uh, Subspace iteration is really the combination of that process with just selecting a special subspace. And that's the subspace of this type. So given now X, X here is a matrix. It's the basis of the original subspace you have. You multiply it by A to the power K, and you do now Rillerich really projection on that subspace. And then you repeat. That's all there is to it, actually. Here is this, the first part is here. You compute this polynomial of A times X. And I'm switching from A to the K to a polynomial, a more general polynomial. And then you have, you put Rayleigh Richts, which gives you a new basis, uh, Q till, uh, X, X new. And then you set X to that, be that one, and you repeat. OK, so there's two different things. The really rates could be done in different ways. You could, do, you could, do, uh, you could use uh, uh, sure factorization, or you have a, th a normal basis, or diagonalization. But if you stick with the symmetric case, it, it doesn't matter, OK? So let's go now to uh, some theory. This is something that you could show. Uh, there is a, I'm, I'll just go through the result very quickly here. If UI is the, so the eigenvalues are, are sorted this way, and you have M that are separated from the others. And uh, you call PK the orthogonal projector on this LK, which is the span of the, the subspace X, which you have uh, computed here. This is, this is XK. And then, essentially, the distance from UI to that subspace 
is bounded from above by something like this. And this is some initial error. And you have uh, uh, this ratio plus epsilon k to the power k where epsilon k goes to zero. The, the, this epsilon k actually is only here when you have a non-diagonalizable matrix. Otherwise, you can just, this goes away. And this actually gives you some convergence result with, uh, with a, ra a ratio like this. So I'm going to go back to the original uh, thing with Chebyshev, how, how, how people use Chebyshev uh, iteration with this. So if you are familiar with IcePack, which is uh, the uh, which came before Lindpack, before uh, Lindpack, yeah, and I, IcePack came out of the of a book by Wilkinson and Reinsch, where they have collected a number of uh, uh, algorithms written in Algol. Okay, and uh, all of those were put in IcePack except subspace iteration, which was written by Rittishauser. And the, well, there was later on there was a uh, a, a Fortran code that was circulated called Ritzit, which implemented some of these things. So the key, the key here is not as much the relative risk projection, or the key is to select the polynomial, the degree and the polynomial every time. So you, what you see here is what is the best polynomial, at least what is thought to be the best polynomial. So if you look at, if, if you have a subspace of dimension M, these are the ones that you're uh, trying to calculate, essentially. And this is what you want to dump out, lambda N, lambda m plus one. And so what you do is you take a Chebyshev polynomial that has uh, in between the, essentially you map the matrix A into this new matrix here. So you shift it and, and scale it in such a way that the eigenvalues that you don't want are now between minus one and one. Okay. And that turns out to be not quite optimal if you think in terms of subspaces. It's optimal if you think of one singular, one particular eigenvalue. But not, uh, when you th think in terms of subspaces, I will show later on some experiments, it's not quite uh, the best you could do. So anyway, that's, this is the, the, uh, what was implemented in those days. And uh, you know, the whole thing is to select a, K, a degree that's not too high, because otherwise you get linear dependence. And then you have to estimate these, lambda, these lambdas here. They're not known in advance, obviously. A lot of things going there. Okay, so uh, people uh, have a sort of uh, preference for crowd of methods in general, but in this context, actually, there are some advantages and disadvantages to both of these methods. Crowd of subspace methods are fast; they require only one starting vector, and but they have other. They have some disadvantages. They, it's very difficult to make something work with a changes. All right. Uh, it's not easy to update. This is actually something we, we, we encountered when we were looking at uh, problem of uh, electronic structure cal calculations where you have this self-consistent loop where you, have, you compute essentially a subspace. And when you, you compute it, if you, if you use long shots, then you have computed a subspace. And you want to restart a new subspace, then you need one vector only. And then you could use a block long shots, obviously. But it's not that easy. You need a lot of vectors that way. But so that, uh, this requires, uh, it, it's uh, uh, an issue when you have a, a subspace to update. Another thing which, is a, which was a problem for the same, pro for the same uh, sort of uh, problems we were dealing with is that if you do any sort of restarting, like, you know, there are essentially the amount to deflation. And that means that the first eigenvectors you compute have to be accurate. And if, there, if you, that you say, let's say I only four digits, 10 minus four, then the rest you get, uh, the, the other eigenvalues you get will be garbage in general. It's not, you have to have high accuracy from the beginning. Only at the end can you afford to get uh, low accuracy. So it's not very convenient for calculations like that, where you don't need a very high, very high accuracy for the subspace. Subspace iteration, on the other hand, has disadvantages. It's, the updates are easy. It really is something geared towards subspaces, and it tolerates changes in A. So this is all, by the way, this, all, all I'm talking about here is the context of we, we only need, you need uh, to use metric vector products. You could do something better if you can uh, solve, and, uh, like shift and inverse and so on. So uh, looking at this now, I'm going to start to looking at a different perspective because I'm trying to see if I could look at 
subspace iteration from the angle of gradient type methods. Now, the gra uh, gradient methods have, the, uh, have this property that if you change the gradient just a little bit, you get something that's very resilient. It, it still converges as long as you have a certain angle between the actual gradient. So that's the initial motivation. In the end, it's something that's somewhat different, but that was the initial motivation. So uh, now I'm going to try to see how we could do this on, on uh, Grassmann manifold. Grassmann manifolds are simply, simply uh, manifolds of, uh, that represent subspaces. So let's go, let's go to the notation here. The Stiefel manifold, actually this is called the Stiefel manifold, is simply the set of matrices that are n by p that, are, uh, that have orthonormal columns. That's a very simple definition. The Grassmann manifold is a quotient manifold of uh, a speed divided by a set of unitary matrices, the orthogonal group. What does it mean is simply that if you take two matrices, y1 and y2, and you should transform one to the other by unitary transformation to the right, then the two matrices are in the same class. So this is an equivalent class, it creates an equivalent class. And the same, all there is to it really is that you're trying to represent a subspace rather than a matrix. So this is now, uh, each of these represents a subspace of dimension P in Rn. Okay. Uh, and it's very convenient to represent the subspace by one representative. In, uh, in, uh, in the class. And then you, put, you use this notation here. Very common notation when you talk about equivalence classes. Okay, so I'm going to summarize what was done uh, in 1999 by uh, Arias and, uh, Edelman, Arias, and Smith. This is actually a very well known paper, and it's, it has a lot of things in it. And the, what, what I'm talking about here is specifically the, the, the ideas that deal with uh, uh, maximizing the, tra the trace. So uh, the tangent space of the Grassmann manifold at Y uh, is the set of matrices delta that are the same shape, same dimension, that at Y transpose delta is equal to zero. This is from that paper. And then that paper tried to consider a, a method in which they maximize or minimize something like this with this constraint, the orthogonality constraint. The gradient of phi of Y at, at point y is given by this. So it's, you, you take a y and then you orthogonalize it against the y. Okay. And then what they did was to say, well, let's try to do Newton's method on the Grassmann manifold. But, you know, you have to think of this thing. It's, you don't have really, uh, it's a manifold, but you, you cannot comp, uh, essentially picture it very well. It's just points, each point is a subspace, and you want to do Newton on that manifold. And they succeeded in doing something. Uh, by looking very, very carefully at uh, all these objects. So, for example, in, in, the process of, of, uh, uh, in the process of doing Newton's method for this, for maximizing this or minimizing it, then you need to solve a system like this, where it has, it has, this is a Hessian, but it's uh, expressed in certain complicated ways. Essentially, what you need to do is solve something like this every, at every step. Despise this projector, uh, this is like a Sylvester type equation. CY is this matrix in here. And it turns out that what they did was to say, if you solve, uh, you know, if you solve this, you need to essentially write delta in this form, Y is the current point, and Z is a solution of this Sylvester equation. Okay. So there are quite a few publications. It was a very hot, hot topic in those days. This is in the 1990s, 2000. Uh, this paper I found very interesting to read because it has, uh, it puts the, the, uh, the uh, measures and things like that, topology uh, on the Grassmann manifold. Uh, this one is a very basic, very, I mean, a very old paper. It has a lot of uh, fundamental theory as to essentially how to define these distances and so on to make this thing work. Okay, uh, these are papers that are related to uh, these approaches. They're essentially approaches of the same type. I should mention that Francois Chatelain passed away last year and we had an event recently and I did mention this work of hers. So now let's look at, uh, continue with this and then recall the notation. Recall that the gradient is like this. 
Okay? Now, uh, what I would like to do is do a gradient type method. So I would like to go move from y to the new y, y tilde, by adding mu times g, where g is this, this matrix here, okay? The gradient. But I have to realize that this is not, this is not really on, on the manifold, obviously, right? So but this is essentially moving along the tangent space. Uh, you could follow a geodesic, and that's what they do in this paper that I mentioned. Uh, however, I found it to be a little complicated to do, to do it this way. So what we do instead is to uh, follow this path here. So you're going to go uh, y plus mu g for all different mu's. What you do is you, you consider not this matrix, but the manifold corresponding to it, it's, right? So you have to represent the space that's spanned by this matrix. So uh, now let's look at the phi of the y tilde. It's very easy to see that you get something like this. It's quadratic form, uh, quadratic function of mu, rather. OK. And uh, b but you have to realize that this is not what I want, because the y tilde here is, is just this, this thing here. It's not in the manifold. So what I need to do is to somehow reorthogonalize the space uh, without changing the, the, the span. Because y transpose j is zero, then you get this relation. And this will allow us to essentially orthogonalize the span, uh, orthogonalize this matrix uh, without changing the span. So if I call g transpose j this matrix, if I diagonalize the matrix, uh, then I need to multipl right multiply y tilde by this matrix here to make it orthogonal. This is very easy to verify. Then this matrix could become orthogonal. Uh, this is the matrix that's orthogonal. Now I'm going to replace this y, y tilde here by this matrix. Now we have to realize this has in it something that depends on mu. And it gets a little bit messy, but it's not too bad, actually. So I, I need to define these two matrices, the diagonal matrices. They're obtained by from uh, a diagonal matrix of, of these. So this is y u, which is this matrix. U is the matrix I have from the diagonalization from, uh, from uh, G transpose G right here. OK. And then something similar with, with G, all right? And then once you get these mat diagonal matrices, then phi, phi of, 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 mu of, uh, of Y of mu is obtained is equal to this. OK. So uh, and then it's, it becomes trivial to see that this is this rational function. We have rational function here, and you would like to minimize this or maximize it if you're looking for the, the maximum. Uh, so I, I think I actually I'm looking at the maximum in this particular uh, box. So I'm going to try to find the maximum of this for all mu. Now we see that if, you, if mu goes to infinity, uh, this does not really go to infinity as, as we saw, uh, as you had here. This one here, you could, you could have something that goes to infinity possibly here, right? But the, that's because the uh, y tilde was not properly scaled. Here now, it's, it's exactly, you're doing exactly the minimization on the manifold or maximization on the manifold. So these functions here are easy to analyze. You can, the derivatives are here. And this, these derivatives are inverted parabola. Oh, OK. So I have uh, to uh, speed up a little bit. So then you can find the minimum and the maximum uh, of these uh, uh, where, where the, of these functions, and you can find an interval where you're, you're sure that the mix, maximum will be, will be located. It's really a matter of just uh, uh, taking, you know, you can find the interval and then discretize it and you find the maximum, so it's all doable. And here's the algorithm, okay? So you, you compute, uh, you, this is your current G, you compute this diagonal like this, you compute the alpha, and you can get mu, the optimal mu, use, using these formulas. And then you set the new uh, the y, and you compute the new g, and you repeat. Now, how about conjugate gradient? So I moved from subspace iteration, which is more like gauss seidel to gradient, right? And now I'm going to try to see conjugate gradient. So this is work in progress. In the conjugate gradient, you do something like this, but you you, uh, the P here mixes essentially the, the current P and the old G, uh, the, sorry, the, 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 
the old P and the, the new G. And we use polar Cubier, which uh, is, uh, requires beta to be of this form. And then we do, we do an extra step, which is this one here, which is we reproject on the, manifold, the, on the tangent space. This is because I absolutely need this relation. And otherwise, these things will not work. So I, and it's actually also essential to be on the manifold. So this is what we do. And then uh, you, you get essentially this uh, algorithm here, uh, where you, this is just really, it's very much like conjugate gradient, except for extra steps like factorizations in here and so on. Okay, so let me give you a couple of uh, numerical tests here. So uh, this, these are two, just two matrices. One is a finite difference matrix of, of 35 by 40. And then the other one is a matrix from the uh, Swift Pass collection. And so these are small matrices. And what I would do is just take dimension eight. Some specification done here is with the optimal shift. And also for Chebyshev, I have the two, two different methods, so I'll tell you why. So here is, the, on the left side, I'm looking at one measure of, of uh, performance, and that is the trace. So the trace, this is some specification. This one here, Chebyshev, the optimal Chebyshev, the one that's classical. And this one is the one that I, for which I found the optimal, my optimal shift. Uh, it's not the best one from the theory because it's a subspace. We're not looking at one specific eigenvalue. And here, what you do is you have a different, you have a different measure, and that is that measure is the uh, invariance. Okay. And again, you uh, you see here uh, the gradient. By the way, I didn't show the gradient. The gradient is is the, the pink one, and then you can, conjugate gradient is like at the top here. Here's conjugate gradient. And then you have the subspace situation here, Chebyshev gradient, and then the, the, Chebi, the Chebyshev with a different shift. That's a different example with, with uh, that matrix Euker B, and a uh, very similar picture. In this case, Chebyshev actually overtakes conjugate gradient at the end. Okay, so that's really all I had to say about this. The only thing, uh, I have two more minutes. Yeah, so I'm gonna say very quickly something about Join diagonalization. This is a problem that's very important in uh, uh, signal processing. But you, ha you have a set of matrices, A1, A2, AP, oops, uh, and you want to find a unitary matrix Q such that each Q transpose AIQ is close to a diagonal. So you're trying to diagonalize them at the same time. Okay? And this is uh, the standard problem. In the standard problem, the AIs are dense. And the, the classical algorithm that has been uh, uh, used in this context is a Jacobi-like algorithm. We do use rotations to eliminate the, the zeros for all the matrices, and that the cost is order P and Q. So uh, we, as you see here, the, the, the measure of, of uh, the, the objective function that's used is this one here, off means off diagonal. And what we do is we try to use subspace iteration approach. So you, you have a subspace uh, use, you try to find a common matrix Q. Now for a large matrix, you cannot use what, uh, the uh, Jacobi approach. So you try to find Q so that AI, Q minus Q, DIs are all small. And that means you use a, an objective function like this. And I'm gonna make the story short. This is the story a little shorter than uh, I had to plan, but this is, you can use subspace iteration for each of the subspaces and then you you put all, you, you gather all this, the, these XIs and you do an SVD, you get the subspace that's common, et cetera. And now what you're trying to do is use this approach I talked about with uh, uh, using the gradient and so on, with conjugate gradient and so on. We're trying to combine that with this approach. So concluding remarks. Uh, so there's a lot of tasks that uh, deal with the varied subspaces and it's very beneficial to look at these from the angle of uh, subspaces as opposed to uh, eigenvalue problems. Crowder methods are uh, not very good for these types of problems, but they tend to be very good, uh, amazingly powerful for, all, for their other techniques. And I will end by saying happy birthday, Claude. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yusuf. Are there any questions for Yusuf? Yeah. yeah. Not be joint diagonalizable. Most 
Right, yes, it cannot, yeah. Could you, could you cannot, repeat the question? Oh, sorry, sorry yes. Consider. The question mm -hmm. was, uh, if you had uh, the matrices that you, if you don't want, don't have them, you don't have to have them all diagonalizable, but, but nearly diagonalizable. But of course, the, yeah, that's, the, that's, the, that's exactly the problem. That's because you cannot necessarily have them all diagonal. And uh, very often you, in the application, uh, these, covari these, these are covariance matrices, they come from situations where there is, there is some common signal, so there's some, some subspace, and it, it's possible to diagonalize them in theory, but there is noise. So that's the question. That's true, yeah, right. Yeah, there could not be any, any of the matrices, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a white. Thanks. Uh, so when you compute the trace, in principle, you need to com know all the eigenvalues. And so how do you largely you choose your subspace? If you would, or if do you need to know how many large eigenvalues you have, and then you choose a subspace? If I, if I, want, if I have a, I don't really compute the trace explicitly. Uh, the, one, the, question, the question was, if I compute the, the trace, you need to you know the eigenvalues. Now this is for, the, for these applications, I have a small matrix Y, which is N by, N by P, and I'm trying to, to maximize, for example, trace of Y transpose AP, right? Y, y is orthogonal. That's the goal. I don't need necessarily to, to, do, to I get explicitly the, uh, so that's the goal, yeah. We work with that as, as an objective function. Any other question here? Yeah. So, when you the first part of the talk uh, to what you do, uh, Sorry. I would probably call a Romanian creating descent with exact line search. Uh, uh, do you think there's any chance to do a convergence analysis? A oh, that's, yeah, so analysis? that's a good question. Uh, I'm looking at that right now. So the question has to do with convergence analysis, whether there's a chance to do a convergence analysis. Yeah, I think for the gradient, possible. It's not, uh, I, I, I'm looking at it right now. Conjugate gradient is much harder. It's a very different context. And, but the gradient, possibly. And then in fact, the, the work that we've done uh, on, uh, by the first paper I mentioned by uh, uh, Van Duren and those, that has a nice, very nice analysis where you could, uh, which could be exploited. Let me just comment that there is a variant which is called the Romanian CG, and that could be a special case of what you are doing, and I think the uh, convergence analysis is very hard. I right. think there are yeah. very few results. Okay, well, that's good to know, yeah. Uh, very nice talk for this simultaneous uh, diagonalization. Do you know there is an algorithm F called FG by Fluri and Gauchi that also tries to simultaneously diagonalize oh, matrices? Gauchi, was, Gauchi has worked on this early on, yes. Yes, yes, yes it's, a, it's an yeah. old paper. I implemented right, right. this once. It just came to my mind now. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mentioned that in the yes. paper, yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. So, is there any question from people uh, looking at the video? Yes. Questions from the audience? No, apparently not. Nobody, nobody is. Uh, okay. So, is there any, any question in the room again? No. Okay. So we thank again, Yusuf, for his. Thank you. Nice, nice <laughs>